Howard Coffin is a seventh generation Vermonter. He has worked as a public relations consultant, a writer, a lecturer, and a tour guide. Um, specifically, he has worked as a reporter for the Rutland Herald and the Christian Science Monitor. He's held the position of news director at the University of Vermont, a former press secretary to U.S. Senator James Jeffords. He has served on the National Civil War Site Advisory Committee, and he served on the board of the Association for the Preservation of Civil War Sites. He has written nine books in total, four of them on the Civil War. He's a Vietnam vet. Somewhere along the way, his eye glanced off the Civil War and on to 1816, the year without a summer, and he's here to tell us about that. Well, thank you. I, uh, as some of you may know, I was married to a Hardwick lady for the best 17 years of my life, Susan Perry. She died seven years ago. And that uh, autograph book came from her possessions. She went, she went to the local high school here. She grew up here. She was a native. She was quite simply the best human being I ever met. And I haven't had a day in seven years that I haven't missed her terribly. Uh, she was what, and nine years younger than I was, and she was supposed to be taking care of me. But sometimes things don't work out that way. Well, I am sorry about last night. I have given over 800 talks in Vermont, and I've only done that once. It was a wonderful Friday night, just like tonight. I was sitting on my back deck drinking beer, and the phone rang, and it was a woman in Isle Lamont saying, Mr. Coffin, there are 75 people here waiting for you to speak. What we did was uh, the same thing we've done here is jump ahead uh, 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 back a night, and uh, there were 125 people there. That, but I'm afraid tonight here we've lost people, and I'm very sorry about that. I just don't know. I wrote it down wrong, I guess. There were, I had a very close call just before COVID. I was speaking, I thought, in Richford. I drove to Richford on a night like this, and it was at the Congregational Church, and at quarter of seven, the talk was supposed to start at seven, there was nobody around. And this woman drove up, and she walked up and opened the church, unlocked the church door. So I said, well. So I went up, and I said, is there a Civil War program here tonight? And she said, no, there's nothing happening here tonight, but my brother-in-law just went to Enosburg to hear Howard Coffin. <laughs> oh, my Lord. It's about 12 miles, and I never drove so fast in my life. Oh, my Lord. And I walked in, and there was a huge crowd, and the lady at the at the uh, podium, looked at me and said, oh, we thought you were wrapped around a telephone pole. <laughs> wow, I was only 10 minutes late. So anyway, here we are. <laughs> I am uh, here. All right. Well. This is not the Civil War. Lore of the mountains, the deep hills, the ravines, the great lake. I grew up with lore on the back edge of the age before television, thank God. I grew up in Woodstock. And there was a tale about Woodstock that in the middle of the village green, a vampire's heart had been buried around 1790. And sometime in the 1800s, somebody decided to dig down and see if there was anything left of it, and smoke rose from the ground, and he didn't dig far. I spent a lot of my 
childhood in Bridgewater, Vermont, which is the next town over, the west. Woodstock is, you will probably know Woodstock is kind of a ritzy town. Bridgewater is a mill town. My aunt and uncle worked in the mill and they lived in a tar paper shack and they were so much fun. And I spent a great deal of time there and every day after work at the mill, they went to Percy Soldier's Saloon. And I heard more lore in Percy Soldier's Saloon. My uncle used to take me to Chateaugee, which is a wooded area uh, that, that encompasses part of Bridgewater, part of Bethel, part of Stockbridge. If you look at the center of Vermont, you'll see a white area on the maps, and Chateaugee, and it was a wild area, and he would show me there were gold mines there. There had been a gold rush in, 18, in 1858, and the mines were still there. And he'd show me these old foundations. Nobody knew who, who had lived there. And, oh, the forests were deep, and the, there were caves, and there were stories of giant cats that prowled the hillsides. And one night I was fishing on a pond all by myself, and something screamed, the likes of which I've never heard. And then it screamed again, and I canceled my plans to spend the night up there. Oh, did I get out of there. And then one night at Soldier's Saloon, I heard the story of the strangest creature. Part deer and part wild boar that roamed the hills of Chateaugui. And the hillsides are so steep, and it only ran in direction, although nobody could decide whether it was clockwise or counterclockwise, that its legs were shorter on one side of its body than on the other. And it had, of course, it had antlers. But nobody had ever seen one. They've seen the trails. They've seen, their, they'd seen the prints. But there was a man who lived called Old Shattagy, who had seen them, but nobody had ever seen Old Shattagy either. So. <laughs> you know, the, the Vermont lore keeps going on. There's a man in Barrie now who swears that he's seeing Sasquatch in Callis. Absolutely. And uh, there, there's a man, uh, there's people in, around Glastonbury who say down there that they What about dowsing? I'm a dowser. My grandfather was quite well known as a dowser. Everybody around Pomfret came to him when they needed to find water. And he taught me, and if I have an apple stick in my hand, and when I strike water, if I don't ease up on my grip, it'll tear the skin off my hands, the power of the thing. And I have no idea what, what makes it work. No idea. Nobody does. But not all, you know. Talk of the side hill cruncher and the Sasquatch. When, during my days as a newspaper man, I learned that most rumors have a basis in fact. And then there's 1800 and froze to death. That is true lore. But first, on the morning of September 6, 1814, a British army of 10,000 crossed the international border into New York State close by Lake Champlain. Marching south into the United States of America were perhaps the world's finest soldiers, veterans of the Napoleonic Wars. Now you're saying, well, oh my God, he didn't get here last night and now he's got the wrong speech. No. <laughs> uh, we're diverting ourselves for a moment. The decisive battle of the War of 1812 was about to happen. It had been a strange two-year war with much fought over trade rights. 
Now the British had come again against the United States of America as at Ticonderoga, Saratoga, Yorktown. Behind hastily completed fortifications on the south bank of the Saranac River at Plattsburgh, New York, was a ragtag American army of 4,000 men. 2,500 of those 4,000 were Vermonters. Wow. Isn't that something? They had crossed Lake Champlain in any kind of craft they could find. It was like Dunkirk in reverse, you know. And they got there, they, they rallied on their village greens when they knew that the, heard that the British were coming and off they went. The British went into camp on the north bank of the Saranac River. Skirmishing across the river began. Waiting close by in Plattsburgh Bay, behind the protection of Cumberland Head, which is a peninsula of land that comes down, separates the bay from the lake, was an American fleet led by Commodore Thomas McDonough, a Maryland man. The fleet had been built at Virgins during the winter. The morning of September 11th, 1814, a mighty British fleet appeared off Cumberland Head, sailing before a strong north wind. Spotting the American ships, the British swung west, then north. And there at close range was the American fleet in line of battle. McDonough already had them. The British wanted a long-range battle because their cannons were bigger. But all of a sudden, when they came around Cumberland Head, there were the Americans. The clever McDonough had outwitted them. And the American shorter-range guns opened fire suddenly. McDonough had his ships were manned by men who had never been sailors before. They had been hastily trained. But by goodness, like Vermonters, they knew how to shoot. And uh, the battle began with McDonough firing the opening shot, and it hit the steering mechanism of one of the British ships, and it was out of the battle instantly. As the Crown's warships advanced, they also were against the wind. It was, it was, a, uh, it was a, an early uh, building a disaster. In Plattsburgh, the British fake uh, an assault on the town by crossing, uh, looking as if they're going to cross the Saranac. Then they go three miles to the west and cross way out there to come in behind the Americans but the Vermonters were waiting in the woods, and they stopped the British cold. Back in the Bray, the British opened fire. One of the first shots smashed a cage on McDonough's flagship, sending the ship's pet rooster to the yard arms, where he crowed on the sailors below through the whole battle. Uh, when, when, the, when the small British gunboats at the, uh, left the big ships and attacked. McDonough, with two matching pistols, was on the edge of his ship to drive them off. It's quite a story, this man. Now, the largest ship that, a warship that ever plied Champlain's waters, the Confiance, 34 cannon, was hit in the rudder unable to swing around. It could only use one broadside. A man on the, on the shore said the firing was terrific, fairly shaking the ground, and so rapid that it seemed to be one continuous war in, a roar intermingled with spiteful flashing from the mouths of guns and dense clouds of smoke soon hung over the two fleets. Soon British gunboats closed on the American flagship again, but once again McDonough's and his men, the sharpshooters, you see, drove them away. Within two hours, with three ships out of commission, the British surrendered. When word of the American naval victory reached the British soldiers out along the Saranac, they received orders immediately to march north. And within 
two days they were back in Canada. The decisive battle of 1812 was over. The British would sign the Treaty of Ghent, ending the war on Christmas Eve, 1814. Someday, if I live long enough, there will be a marker on Champlain's shore where those Vermonters landed. I know where it happened. They won that battle. So the war was over, but the effects of the conflict would linger, particularly in Vermont, partly in revenge. New England markets were flooded with British goods. An ec economic depression hit northern New England in the war's aftermath, as did an epidemic of spotted fever, which some call the plague. The post-war year of 1815 proved to be a tough one for Vermont and New Hampshire. We'll be getting into New Hampshire a bit here. That autumn brought unusually cold weather, though the 1815-16 winter was really rather mild. My uh, paternal grandmother, Bertha Minerva Metcalf Coffin, who grew up on a hill farm in Pomfret, introduced me to all this. On a cold day, she might say, Feels like 1800 and froze to death, Howard. And I wondered, lore? What is this, you know? She wasn't the woman that you questioned a lot. Powerful woman. So came 1816, a year forever recalled in Vermont history. Indeed, in the history of the world. A trying time of cold and darkness was coming to the struggling people of Vermont and to much of the planet. According to a, a fine book by Nicholas and William Klingeman, The Year Without Summer and the Volcano That Darkened the World, the 500 years that preceded 1800 were part of a period of global cooling known as the Little Ice Age. New England had for centuries from time to time experienced very late and very early frost. As the 1800s began, speculation on possible causes of the chill weather included an unusual number of sunspots. Also, suspicion turned to the presence on many barns of a new and ingenious safety device, lightning rods. Were they causing strange things to happen in the sky? Thank you, Benjamin Franklin. You see. <laughs> Beginning in 1809, several major volcanic eruptions had occurred in the South Pacific. In 1812, two mountains exploded in the Indian Ocean. In 1814, one let loose in the Philippines. Then came April 5th, 1815. On that fateful day, a sizable mountain in the Indonesian archipelago blew its top. Mount Tambora on the island of Sumbawa in the Dutch East Indies, now known as Indonesia. A series of eruptions sent ash and smoke 25 miles upward. People 800 miles distant heard the blast. Estimates of the number killed near the eruption reached 15,000. Another 80,000 perished in the next 12 months from disease and starvation in that area. Within a full day, a massive mushroom-shaped cloud, a portent for the Pacific. Remember the Artes? Mm -hmm. Yes, Artes, atomic and hydrogen. Covered hundreds, a mushroom-shaped cloud covered hundreds of miles Later research put the power of the explosion at 100 times Mount St. Helens. Dylan Darcy Wood, an Illinois, uh, University of Illinois climate change researcher, recently published a magnificent article, 1816, the year without a summer, a study of the worldwide effects of the Tambora event. She said that, quote, the entire East Indian region was plunged into darkness and that the global history of the event is dizzying in scale and difficult to articulate. The volcanic cloud contained a million tons of ash 
As an historian friend of mine and distant cousin, Larry Coffin, has said, a giant aerosol and ash cloud was suspended in the atmosphere. And it began to move around the world, reflecting sunlight, causing cooler temperatures and abnormal weather. Within weeks, spectacular sunsets were seen in Europe and New England. In September 1815, when snow fell, it had a brown and red tinge. But nobody, nobody at that time connected Tambora with what was about, was beginning to happen. That did not happen until the 20th century. So you see, what is this? You see. As I said, the winter of 1516 was a mild one. But, but though by long ago standards. And winters were far tougher in those days. Some of you here are old enough to remember real cross. Remember you'd take a runner sled out up anywhere, you know, and shoo. of course I didn't weigh as much then, but and who needed snowmaking equipment? You know? yeah. My father, I remember my father shoveling snow and throwing it up over his head all, all the time, you know. And, Yet we went to school every day. Yeah. Much of the snow had disappeared by early March 1816. Late April produced a heat wave. The estimable Vermont historian Abbe Maria Hemingway wrote that this was all brought, this all brought on expectations of a fruitful season and an abundant harvest. In late April, some Vermont farmers began putting in crops as temperatures reached the 80s. Certainly, I learned growing up in Vermont that you never plant until Memorial Day. Yeah. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. That's a rule. That mildness continued into early June, but only until the 6th. That night, a blizzard struck. Throughout Vermont, snow and sometimes hail fell. Snow totals reached 12 inches with drifts to 3 feet. In St. Johnsbury, Jacob Ide recorded, Frost and ice were as common as buttercups, usually were. Some sheep that had just been shorn froze to death. Birds who could find no shelter also perished. In Stowe, it was recorded that the farmers turned their cattle into the forest where they found underbrush and leaves to subsist on. June 7th, James Winchester near Craftsbury said that his uncle set out in the storm for the sheep lot, saying, if I am not back in an hour, call the neighbors and start them after me. June is a bad month to get buried in the snow. <laughs> Three days later, searchers found the family sheep safe under a pine bough shelter the uncle had built. They found the uncle a mile away, headed in the opposite direction from home. Barely alive in the snow, he survived. The North Star newspaper in Danville, quote, snow 20 inches on June 8th, water froze an inch thick. It summed up the first half of June, melancholy weather. The shoots of leaves of forest trees which were just putting forth, and corn and garden vegetables that were out of the ground were mostly killed. Benjamin Harwood in Bennington on June 8th, sweeping blasts from the north all four part of the day. Vermont historian Walter Hill Crockett wrote, the leaves of the trees were killed and the beaches did not put out leaves again that year. Sheep who had just been sheared and, and, and where it was possible, the fleeces were bound around the bodies of these animals to keep them from freezing. In Hardwick, a man noted, the forest leaves were all killed and the woods went in mourning through the summer. Thanks to the generosity of this very active historical society up here, I think, uh, some uh, months ago, I was given a letter written from Heartland to some people in Hardwick by a reverend named Timothy Grow. Do you have something to do with this? 
I'm afraid I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know it was a godsend because right after I got this, I spoke in Heartland. Absolute coincidence. Absolute coincidence. Timothy Grow. He had children here in Hardwick. And this is a letter he writes on June 10th. This is part of it to the kids. I write to inform you of the special season which has attended us of late. The wind is strong at northwest, the clouds breaking, and the sky that way, glistening like January. I said to our folks, if the crops are not all frozen in the morning, it will be a miracle. But God saw fit to draw a thick cloud over the horizon and kept the wind up so that it froze but trifling. Yesterday it cleared off and moderated a little. This morning there was frost as has been for four mornings together, even hard enough to freeze over water in the tub. Thursday and Friday snow a great part of both days, so that the hills north and east were almost white till almost noon. It appeared to be very doubtful. It appeared to be a very doubtful time in our country respecting the fruits of the earth. Many are saying, I will go to Ohio or some other parts and get away from the cold weather. We will come back to this. Seasonal weather returned in mid-June. Temperatures reaching the 80s in southern Vermont. It did not last. Certainly Vermont was not the only place suffering. On June 21st, the Buffalo, New York Gazette noted an uncommonly cold spring. Cape May, New Jersey paper reported on six days of freezing temperatures in June. In the first week of July came scattered frost throughout Vermont. Then the weather warmed, but on July 21st, frost touched most of the state killing corn in northern Vermont. Also, as July progressed, no rain came, and a severe drought settled on the state and all 14 counties. A vivid halo was around the sun, and sunspots were seen all summer long. What was happening? Below average temperatures continued in September. And though a tropical storm touched Massachusetts, there was little rain even in southern Vermont. Indeed, a Vermont newspaper on September 3rd reported on a three-month drought. Forest fires broke out in New York's Adirondacks. Historian Crockett, after the June storm, the corn which had been sprouted again gave promise of maturing, but there was a heavy frost on September chance, just as the ears were ready for roasting, which put an end to the hopes of a late harvest. A Northeast Kingdom man wrote, James Gooding was so hopeless over the prospects that he killed all his cattle and then hanged himself. Mm -hmm. After vainly trying to make his wife do away with herself also, to escape the terrible and gradual death by freezing and starvation, which he believed was to be the common doom. Uh, she didn't buy it at all. Still no rain in the late September, Burlington's Northern Sentinel newspaper said, that forest fires burning from Plattsburgh to Ticonderoga produced smoke that impeded navigation on Champlain, and breathing became difficult. September 18, 16 brought fires throughout the Northeast. The Klingemans talk of smoke causing shipwrecks along the northern New England coast, where ships could not see other ships or lighthouses. The Windsor Journal, Vermont Windsor Journal, in October, the crops of wheat were generally good, but everything else had failed. And even this can hardly be converted into flour for want of sufficient water to keep the mills in operation. The history of Weathersfield in southeastern Vermont said, in the vast fields along the Connecticut, William Jarvis kept huge bonfires going during the worst times 
and save part of his crops. The southwestern part of town and the area known as Kendrick's Corners was spared some of the frosts, frosty nights and matured a fair crop of corn. It is the credit of Jarvis and the farmers of that area that they did not take advantage of their neighbors. They sold their corn in small lots at fair price. William Jarvis, incidentally, is the man that brought the Merino sheep to Vermont, changed the whole state. In the upper Connecticut Valley, the year 1816 became known as the mackerel year. Fish were transported from the seacoast to replace the regular pork supply cut by the scarcity of feed. Fortunately, heavier than usual runs of fish came up the Missisquoi River from Lake Champlain to Swanton. Large seines were put out and operated night and day as people came for miles to trade for fish, many bringing maple products. In Richford on the Canadian border, the town historian said the cold season of 1816 nearly desolated the town. Very few inhabitants remained, and they nearly starved for want of bread. Not an ear of corn fit to, hit, fit to eat was raised here. Vermonters cooked hedgehogs mm -hmm. and boiled nettles as staples of their diets, along with wild turnip root. By the way, I've never eaten a uh, hedgehog, but I did eat a coon once, cooked in cheese. It was the worst tasting thing I ever had. It was at a, it was at a hunt supper, and I had to run outside. An account of, oh, it was awful. An account of Timmouth's history stated that for the most, for the first time, people actually enjoyed eating oatmeal. <laughs> And in Tinmouth, the mills owned by Judge Nathaniel Chipman collected all the pumpkins and corn that could be found and ground them into meal, which was given to those most in need. In Pittsford, a farmer on what is now known as Corn Hill gave corn to his neighbors. In summing up 1816, Walter Crockett wrote, there was a great suffering, but little, if any, actual starvation. As a rule, people helped each other generously, dividing the little they possessed with others less fortunate. The Coventry family reduced to half a loaf of bread, divided this meager supply with a neighbor. Many sheep and cattle perished, owing to the failure of the hay crop. The weather moved some Vermonters to verse. And one wrote in 1816, if God withholds these mild arrays, and sends us frosts and chilling days. E'en snow as late as 8th of June that nips the fruit in early blooms. Shall we be frightened of such things? No, rather frightened of our sins. <laughs> oh dear. Yes. The catastrophe of 1816 surely was the most important meteorological event of the 19th century. People simply did not know the cause of their troubles. But as the year went on, speculation intensified that the hand of God was at work. In the town of Berlin, just north of Montpelier, farm wife Mary Nye wrote in her diary, June 8th, snowed this morning and very cold, freezing the ground. Covered snow and all things were white. Will not mankind mourn for sin, which is the cause of the freezing weather? In Bethel, work on the village's first church was hurried to completion for a consecration service on Christmas Eve. Was God angry? Let's give him a new church for the birthday of his son. Also, a new church was moving to completion at the head of Church Street in Burlington. Local farmers with few crops to work signed on to work, completing the church early, pleasing the Lord. It would be a Unitarian church, still there, presided over by the abolitionist Joshua Young. The Vermont 
Freedom and Unity History said religious enthusiasm declined during the 1812 years, but a new revivalistic surge commenced in 1816. The authors cited the combination of natural catastrophe and financial disarray that followed the war. Now I'm going to take you eastward just a little for a couple of minutes here into New Hampshire, the state where I was a resident for seven years, I'm ashamed to say. <laughs> but just barely, in West Lebanon. Uh -huh. That river is much wider than it looks, let me tell you. I worked at Dartmouth for seven years. Wonderful years. Let me begin by referencing William Little, writing in the town history of Warren. In the northern part, well, it's on the southern edge of the Green Mountains, actually, Warren. The war came first, that of 1812, then the pestilence, then the Black Plague. Then in 1816, famine, famine almost looked into our valley among the hills. A winter, a writer of the time said that the whole face of nature appeared shrouded in gloom. The lamps of heaven kept their orbit, but their face was cheerless. He continued, one August day in Warren, the sky was lurid in the west. The clouds thickened, hailstones rattled on the forest, and the wind shook the tops of trees. Suddenly it grew dark. Then in the twinkling of an eye, the hurricane leaped like a maniac from the skies. Howling, crashing, dizzying it came. The wind leveled a long swath of forest 20 yards wide, which seemed to have been felled by the stroke of some demonic fury. Mm -hmm. He wrote, Stephen Richardson's barn was blown away. Shingles carried two miles to Amos Little's back pasture. Nathan Libby's house was unroofed and furniture scattered over the whole farm. A looking glass was blown 30 yards and deposited on a stone wall without breaking. Oh, no. Ooh. Fences were prostrated. Cows lifted from their feet and sheep were killed. Autumn returned, alas, not to fill the barn with a generous thief, but the eye with a tear of disappointment. Winter came, and with it came starvation, but for the tolerably good crop of rye which supplied inhabitants with bread. In the town of Warner, New Hampshire, that's right on 89, as you know, if you're going down to Boston, not a month, and the whole season escaped the frost and the corn crop as well as certain other crops, was substantially destroyed. destroyed. There was a great scarcity in the country and much suffering. It was at this time that Enoch Dalton, afterward a deacon in the Congregational Church, inquired of Enoch Morrill, a brother church member, at the close of the services one Sabbath day, if he would spare a bushel of corn. Ask me tomorrow, said Morrill, and I will tell you. On Monday morning, Dalton trudged over to Morrill's on Pumpkin Hill, a distance of four miles with a bag under his arm, and asked for the corn I spoke to you about. The reply was this, I have no corn to sell. I spoke to you as I did that you might learn to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Hear this from the history of coastal Newmarket. Frost and cold all summer long. Crops had been planted once, twice, thrice. A killing frost every month of the year and no harvest. No harvest. It would be a long, barren winter. They thanked the Lord for the fish and for the tough salt hay of the lamprey marshes. New Hampshire Governor William Plummer owned a farm in Epping near the coast. He traveled probably 10 times that summer from Epping to Hanover. Why? Because there's something going on in Hanover that made history. The state of New Hampshire was trying to take over Dartmouth College. Hmm. Became known as the Dartmouth College case and it reached the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court. Dartmouth was expected to lose the case. But they hired a graduate, a young lawyer named Daniel Webster, who, whoa, 
And Webster argued in front of the U.S. Supreme Court, and he closed his argument with words that I still, I heard so many times when I was at Dartmouth, I got sick of them, but anyway. He said at the end of his argument, Sirs, it is, as I have said, a small college, but there are those that love it. Well, <laughs> Justice Marshall and the whole court went for Dartmouth, much to the governor's dismay. So anyway, he's going back and forth, and uh, he, he notes in his diary, he's a careful, careful keeper of a diary, uh, all, uh, all through the summer into the fall, we found Indian corn from Hanover to Concord on prime land entirely killed by the late frosts and the stalks and dry leaves. I worried that I would lose so many of my people. Of course, they, they, they didn't. They squeaked by. If the coal wasn't bad enough, the Walpole history, that's the town down there on the, on the Connecticut, the, the New England states witnessed the rise and spread of spotted fever, afterwards known as malignant fever. In that little town, eight people died uh, that summer. Now hear this. In 1817, many residents left for warmer climates of Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and the Great Lakes area. They left in droves. Farmers farms sold cheap. Some were deserted. Certainly a major effect of the, of the cold year was migration, both from Vermont and New Hampshire. Vermont historian, historian Lewis Stilwell, something it seemed had gone permanently wrong with the weather, and when this cold season piled itself on top of all the preceding afflictions, a good many Vermonters were ready to quit. In Hardwick, it was said there were many emigrations from Hardwick to what was then called the West, but few went further than the Genesee Valley, of course, in New York. It is estimated that 15,000 Vermonters left the state uh, because of 1816. That's the number that left Vermont right after the Civil War. Professor Stilwell referenced Genesee fever and Ohio fever infecting Vermont. The town of Waterford, Vermont, on the Connecticut River was called a Gauss town. And it was several years before town meetings were held. Quoting the Langdon, New Hampshire town history, some left the town for the fields of adventure. And the great western regions then looked upon as a sort of El Dorado. In Hartford, Connecticut, a businessman wrote in his diary that for three days running, looking out his window, there was a steady stream of farmers heading through the streets, heading west, getting out of Connecticut. And at Monticello in Virginia, an aging Thomas Jefferson was driven further into debt by a bad crop year. And the Thomas Lincoln family including son Abraham, packed up in 1816 and moved from Kentucky to Indiana. Was the weather, having, did it have anything to do with it? I'm not sure, but probably. One family escaping west was the Smiths, formerly of Sharon, Vermont, in 1816, renting a house in Norwich just across the Connecticut from Dartmouth, of course. This is both a Vermont and a New Hampshire story. The Smiths had a son, Joseph, born in 1805, who, when they lived in Sharon, had contracted a deadly disease. It was a New Hampshire doctor, the co-founder of Dartmouth Medical School, Nathan Smith, who journeyed into the Vermont Hills to the Smith farm to save the seemingly doomed lad. After 1816, the Smiths were among those people who gave up on Vermont. They left for western New York to settle in Palmyra. Their son Joseph would say he found golden tablets and a new religion would come upon the earth, the Mormon faith. Interestingly, when I first gave this talk, in the audience was the head of the Mormon church in Vermont. 
checking on me. <laughs> <laughs> nice guy, though. <laughs> Yes, religion. In Warren, New Hampshire, historian, the local historian wrote, some believe the plague year and the bad summer which followed were visible examples of God's wrath upon his wayward children. For the town of Warren had been established 50 years and still no sign of a church. Why even the governors were stroking the religious fires. Vermont Governor Jonas Galusha in 1816 issued a proclamation the disposer of human events is seen fit. It is holy providence to blast our expe expectations in the latter harvest. We ought enter the courts of the Lord with penitence for sin, prayer for pardon, and ascriptions of praise. Governor Plummer, in his inaugural address, referenced the need to appease God. Religious revivals took place throughout Vermont and New Hampshire in 1816. Certainly there were saints afoot. Otis Warren in Littleton, New Hampshire, had a farm that seemed to be untouched by the weather and gave what he raised away for nothing. There's a monument to him today over there. Incidentally, I recently discovered that there were no tree rings formed in 1816. Mm -hmm. No tree what? No tree rings. Oh, rings. Oh. Yeah, they're, they're not there. Well, we weren't. Mm -hmm. So you have spoken of what used to be called the Twin States, but the Tambora eruption was really a worldwide event. Darcy Wood wrote, in 1816, 1816 was a time when the overwhelming majority of the world's population lived precariously from harvest to harvest. When the crops failed that year and again the next, starving rural legions from China to Ireland swarmed out of the countryside to market towns to beg for alms to sell, to sell and to sell their children in exchange for food. Famine-friendly diseases, cholera and typhus stalked the globe from India to Italy, while the price of bread and rice, the world's staple foods, skyrocketed with no relief in sight. Across a European continent devastated by the European wars, tens of thousands of unemployed veterans found themselves unable to feed their families. They gave vent to desperation in town square riots, military style campaigns of arson, while governments everywhere feared revolution. The 1816 catastrophe in some way touched much of the Eastern United States, at least causing discomfort and fear if not calamities. That year, Congress voted itself a handsome pay raise. Oh, no. <laughs> Unbelievable. In response, American voters cast more than half of them into the streets. <laughs> Bravo. In Germany, 1816 became known as the Year of the Beggar. Tourists of the continent, on the continent mistook beggars moving along the roads for armies on the march. Mm. Good God. In June 1816, the writers Mary Shelley and Lord Byron went from England to the Alps with a group of English tourists, having planned a summer of hiking, scenery, and writing. But the cold hit Switzerland hard, and their summer was mainly spent huddled by the fireplace. Both wrote, and the weather had profound effects on what they produced. Byron composed a poem called Darkness. Here's just a part of it, early, early part of it. I had a dream, which was not a dream. The bright sun was extinguished and the stars did wander, darkling in the eternal space, rayless and pathless, and the icy earth swung blind and blackening in the moonless air. Morn came and went and came and brought no day, and men forgot their passions in the dread of this, their desolation, and all hearts went into selfish prayer for light. God, 
Did that man write? <laughs> Mary Shelley wrote home in June from the shores of Lake Geneva. An almost perpetual rain confines us to the house. One night we enjoyed a finer storm than I have ever before beheld. The lake was lit up, the pines of Jura made visible, and all the scene illuminated for an instant. When a pitchy blackness succeeded and the thunder came in frightful bursts over our heads amid the blackness. That stormy night, she first got the idea for her famous novel. <laughs> Shelley imagined her Dr. Frankenstein waking from a nightmare to find his hideous creature at his bedside, looking on him with watery but speculative eyes. <laughs> I began research on the cold year as the bicentennial of my church, the United Church of Bethel, approached. 1816 church. I gave a talk in the church that year on 1816, closely tied to the church history. The building, as I said, was consecrated on Christmas Eve, 1816. At the close of our bicentennial service on Christmas Eve, exactly 200 years, we all went outdoors into a snowy landscape to watch fireworks donated by one of our members. All was festive as the bombs burst above our tall steeple. But as they lit the night, my thoughts and the thoughts of many others turned far back to the snowy landscape of the year of the church's birth. And the explosions and spreading smoke brought thoughts of Tambora, and the dark skies of long ago, the awesome power of nature came very much to mind. People began to shake their heads, you know. The Vermonters said, mm, mm. You know, they didn't, couldn't get in the mood for fireworks. It was strange. In 1816, a great monster had stalked the seemingly fragile earth. And it was personified for many by Dr. Frankenstein's monster. In closing, let us all be mindful here in 2022 that a far greater monster than Frankenstein's or the year without summer today stalks our planet. Global warming is upon the earth and down the years will wreak far greater catastrophe than the famines and diseases brought on by the Pacific eruption. Let our thoughts, prayers even go toward what even we few may do to help keep this planet lovely and all alone in space, capable of sustaining a human life worth living. As 1816 became history, people far and wide gave it names. The poverty here. The year of no summer, the year without sun, the cold year, the scarce year, the starving year. But generally in Vermont, 1816 was remembered, as my grandmother said, as 1800 and froze to death. But for all that, 1816 went out rather mild. But 1817 turned nasty in February and March. In January 1817, St. Elmo's fire visited Vermont. Strange lights touched treetops, steeples, fence posts, even people's hair. Talk about fright. Today, there is no place to flee to. As we speak, more mighty bergs are calving from the Antarctic ice sheet, and the ancient ice expanse that covers vast Greenland is thinning and thinning. Temperatures in Fairbanks, Alaska remained at or above 70 last summer for 40 days, mm -hmm. far surpassing the earlier record of 15. Mud-spattered polar bears wandered confused. Scientists say the melting of the polar ice sheets will raise the oceans to the level of Lady Liberty's torch. Monster fires unprecedented, whipped by record winds, have scorched, as we know, 
California now, the American South, conflagrations in Australia, New Zealand, monster hurricanes spawned by the warming Atlantic will apparently come on stronger and stronger and stronger. Eventually something will be done significant by mankind. Why not now? Why not now? My thoughts go back to last spring as another baseball season was beginning. Makes me think of my dear friend Dave Morse. I was walking through Montpelier on an ideal April day when I saw a bumper sticker that turned my thoughts to climate change. Its forbidding words were these, nature bats last. <laughs> I will close with the final lines of Lord Byron's mighty poem, Darkness, as he tried to perceive an end of the world brought about by a great change in climate. The rivers, lakes, and ocean all stood still, and nothing stirred within their silent depths. Ships, sailorless, lay rotting on the sea, and their masts fell down piecemeal. As they drooped, they slept on the abyss without a surge. The waves were dead. The tides were in their grave. The moon, their mistress, had expired before. The winds were withered in the stagnant air, and the clouds perished. Darkness had no need of aid for them. She was the universe. Lore, this world shall soon see. Godspeed and thanks for listening.